Welcome to the Mercy Cast, where we are learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I am your host, Raleigh Sadler, and over the past 10 years, I've started a nonprofit that helps people better care for their most vulnerable neighbors. Along the way, I've met a lot of friends that were on a similar journey, each of us learning new things about ourselves and each other with the more adversity that we face. Reality is hard. To be honest, if given the choice between reality and distraction, we would always opt for distraction. Today, I want to tell you Katie's story. Reeling from the loss of her first daughter during a very complicated pregnancy, Katie shares the story in her first book, I Choose Brave. And while she was releasing that book about what it means to fear the Lord and develop a holy courage, she was tested in many of the same principles as her father's health crashed almost overnight when his heart failed. A brand new author, she had her first marketing call with her publishing team from the waiting room of the hospital's ICU. Clearly, she was being called to live and relive the very principles she was writing and speaking on. But God was endlessly faithful, and that learning would eventually become her next book. Today, I'm joined by Katie Westenberg, the author of But Then She Remembered, How to Give God Your Full Attention in a Distracted World. Katie, thank you for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me, Raleigh. So you've just written this book, and then life happens, and now you're relearning the principles of that book. What was that experience like for you? surprising, but it probably shouldn't have been because how often are we just tested in the things we're called to speak upon? So I don't think I saw it coming, but it was amazing to write about those things because when you're writing, you are forced to relive those experiences and then to be going through them and processing them with the Lord at the same time kind of gives you a fresh perspective and also a history with him through it that you have to recognize and realize. It's almost like you become an expert in the content. When I wrote my book, Vulnerable, 30 hours after we launched the book, my house burned down and I was homeless for three months in the city of New York. It was a lot to process. And I laughed it off and I laughed off the trauma. I shouldn't have, but I did. But what I learned was I did. I became this expert in my own story and this expert in my own content. And so as you processed so bravely the story of the loss of your first daughter in your book, I Choose Brave, did this experience that followed, was it good? Was it bad? Was it therapeutic? What was happening when you were experiencing Mm -hmm. that again? It was probably all of that because hard things usually are, right? There's those moments. And I don't even know if I exactly recognized it at first. There was this moment when I was in that pregnancy with my first daughter and it was really complicated from the beginning. They didn't even think I was going to be able to carry her, but but there was always a heartbeat. And then at about 20 weeks, midway through the pregnancy, I had an ultrasound and they realized all my amniotic fluid was gone. And I could just see the look on the face of the ultrasound technician that it went really grave. And she said, I need to go get a doctor. And I didn't know what she was going to say. I didn't know why she got the doctor, but the tears were coming because I knew this is not good. And there was this moment with my dad. So now we're like 15 years later in my life. And my dad is having these heart complications. And he had a a quadruple bypass surgery, but it didn't go well. And he didn't recover well. And it was just, he was fading and fading and fading. And we referred to the big city to go see the big doctors. And we're sitting around this table. And they said to him, we want to talk to you about a heart transplant. And I remember my dad's face just dropping like, what are we even talking about here? He was so lost and confused. And that was the moment that I noticed the connection. Like, I know what it's like to be here. I know what it's like to hurt and hope and pray and have faith. And then it seems like, what? It's just going to get worse. It's just going to get harder. This isn't, this isn't my recovery moment. This, there's so much heart ahead that I'm going to have to trust the Lord with. So that's when I really began to see the parallel there. And then proceeding through what that looked like for him while I was editing the book really made the connection. So it was hard, but it was sweet. And it was a moment of just noticing how faithful the Lord was in that other story. And, and also how he had grown me through that. Sometimes we go through things and we think, I I don't know if I didn't do it perfect. I didn't do it beautiful. I don't know if I learned anything. I don't know what I'd say to a mom who's losing a baby right now. Like there's no, I don't have any magic words. It's hard, right? But to go through those again and see how my faith had changed. And my actions and belief in the Lord had changed. There's a depth there that I hadn't realized until I went through it again with my dad. That was a sweet part of it. 
I've noticed that sometimes we can see our own growth as we are caring for others on the other side of what we went through. And that's really what you were experiencing there, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And so you had gone through this situation with your daughter and now you are in this situation with your father and you have seen your growth. You have noticed some changes. What did that look like specifically for you? Specifically, it looked like faith because with my daughter, you're just wondering what the worst happened. What is the worst happened? Can we answer that question? Like, is God still good? Is he Mm -hmm. still faithful? What if this pregnancy, so we lead it this far only to make it this far and she's not going to survive? So then what? Then who is God there? But when you've gone through those things, you know, I know exactly who God is there. I know who he was through scripture when the Israelites doubted. And so all of that stuff that maybe you read and you know, but and never really had skin on it. When you ha- when you live that, it changes the dynamics. So what if my dad is taken from me? What if he's gone? I love my dad. I'm super close to my dad. He's still alive today. He's survived all of that now. But what if I do lose him? Is that okay? Is God still good? Is there still goodness on the other side of this? There's so many selfish pretenses that get involved in that and you just don't even know how you're going to survive. And you you hear stories of other people going through hardships in their life and like you think, how would I ever survive that? But then you begin to know the answers that I know because if that's what God has, God is good. And will it hurt? Absolutely will it hurt. It will hurt. Will it will be bad. But there's goodness on the other side because God is good. So answering those questions changed the day to day. It changed the fear. It changed even how we would step into it, how we would pray, all of that. Sounds like your experience of adversity has shaped the way you see God and understand his character. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What advice would you give to people who they're listening to this, they're going through things right now, and they're beginning to think, well, maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe he doesn't see me. Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he's focused somewhere else. Maybe his attention is on someone else who's hurting way more. What would you say to that person who's grappling with their understanding of who God is as they're experiencing a trial? I would say those feelings are real. And we bump into those. It doesn't have to be a massive diagnosis. It doesn't have to be your house burning down. It can just be failure as a parent. It can be failure in a job. It can be failure in a marriage or a friendship or any of those. Like, like I'm not worth this. There's all of those feelings that in a million different ways we can have. But our job is to take thoughts captive and which thoughts are thoughts that like to set themselves up against the knowledge of God, right? Or to bring those into obedience. So I think that's the key of remembering, what do I know to be true about God? Okay, in the situation, am I believing that he failed me? Am I believing that his word is not true? Am I believing he doesn't care about me? So what do, what the, all those emotions I'm having, what do they reveal about my belief about God? Because when we spent time here, I know who he was in the past. And even before I had experienced it in my own life, I'd read it in scripture. I'd heard about it in missionary life. I'd heard about it through my parents, and my grandparents. So all of those experiences and those memories, they have to come to play in that moment. We have to line them up and follow what is true. As I've processed my own grief through things that I've gone through, I've noticed that if I'm unwilling to face the reality of my situation, I will run to distraction. And that was one of the reasons I really wanted to have this conversation with you, because distraction is a killer. It's a momentum killer. It's a self-esteem killer. We think that we are medicating ourselves. We think that we're going to be better, but we're not. Sitting there, Mm -hmm. binge watching Ted Lasso might make us feel great in a moment. It's a good show. I like the show. Great show. But here's the thing. It doesn't recharge me. And if anything, it's me avoiding the thing that I need to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so you've written this book on fleeing from distraction. How do you do that when everything in you wants to ease the pain, to get your mind off of what you're experiencing? The first way is to realize that it's a symptom, not the problem itself. Because I think a lot of times we want to think of distraction as the problem. If I could just distance myself from that, maybe I should toss out my television and be some odd person who doesn't have a television in their home and with your iPhone and your watch and all of these other devices, right? If I could just distance myself and that. And, and I wouldn't say that distancing yourself is a bad idea. Like there can be healthy breaks from these things, but almost everyone I see on social media who takes these social media breaks, they're back and then taking another one. It's like an endless cycle. Is this really the root of the issue that we're struggling with? Or they leave social media and they make a big to-do about it. And they're like, I'm leaving Twitter. I'm leaving Instagram. I'm le-. And they're back in three days. Yeah, yeah, we crawl back sheepishly, right? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. we want to do the grand gesture because we think in doing that, we're going to find the freedom that we seek. But we don't. Mm-hmm. We don't. That's we, right. yeah. 
We are prone to distraction, or as scripture says, actually, this isn't scripture, this is a hymn, but we're prone to wonder. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with, I, I think that's where we need to recognize that can technology be an issue? Absolutely, it can. But you know what? I also believe a newspaper could have been 40 years ago. We can sit on that couch and throw that newspaper up and block out everyone around us because I just want to escape from parenting my children or whatever. So I don't think distractions and our heart for them is really anything new. We've seen it over history. We've seen the Israelites get distracted on their journey. And so God set principles in place to remind them. He says, I want you to remember that. I want you to throw these stones down so you can remember. I want you to tell your kids about what happened in Egypt so you can remember and they can remember and the next generation can remember. So I think remembering and figuring out the heart behind what is causing us to want to escape and distraction is more important than just scooting them to the, the walls themselves. So technology is not the problem, but the problem lies within us. And as you are helping us walk through how to navigate that, you're saying one of the first steps is remembrance, remembrance of who God is, who God has been historically throughout the canon of scripture, but also historically in our lives. And so you're sitting there in a hospital with your father and you can look back over past events in your life and you can see his faithfulness. How does that motivate you to keep going? Well, it, it motivates you to keep going through any of the hard things. And, and we get to borrow faith that way. That's what I think is amazing. Like you didn't have to lose the child to have to go through these things. You didn't have to have your house burned down. Some of us have been sheltered from a lot of pain that others have lived with, right? But this is the beauty of your podcast. This is the beauty of books with people sharing their story. This is the beauty of missionary biographies. And then of course, always scripture. You have other people's stories to think, wait, this is how it works. That, that's really my favorite thing about reading missionary biographies. I want to know how these people got through incredibly difficult situations to keep going so we can borrow from their faith in that time because that's the same God that was faithful to them over in Africa as he is in a Seattle ICU room with my dad and I. So I need, I need to remember those things. The more I can bolster my memory in that moment because we get there, we want to open scripture and like, I need something good, God, because I'm drowning here. But it's the information that we print in ahead of time that's going to serve us well and fuel our faith more actually there. I love this idea of borrowing faith. Because you're right. Many of us have been sheltered from what others experience. And I've heard so many people say, well, I don't really have a testimony because I wasn't hooked on cocaine and selling drugs in kindergarten. And I've heard some very intriguing, intense testimonials at churches. And sometimes when you hear those, it makes you think, well, do I really have a story? And the answer is yes. We have all gone through things. And some of the things that we may downplay in our lives, others may be like, wow, that's really intense. That's really heavy. And we downplay it because it's normal to us. It's something that we know. And so Mm -hmm. you're talking about this idea of saying, well, the community of faith is big and we can look at the stories of other people. And learn from what they're going through. And I agree. I think that's why stories matter because they may be different, but there can be something that we connect with and we can learn from and really embrace. And so you write these books, you're sharing your stories, not to just talk about what you've experienced, but you're doing it to motivate and encourage other people as they are going through things that are similar. And so... You're sitting there, you're writing your new book, and you're trying to help people recall God's faithfulness. You're trying to help people borrow the faith of others. But what happens when distraction keeps coming? Mm-hmm. It's a battle worth fighting, right? Because, because it's so close. It really is everywhere. So I, I'm not going to say that we are going to ever triumph over it. We have these feeling bodies, these feeling minds. But I also know that God designed our bodies for obedience. The way he designed our brain to work is that it can remember, right? So fighting it and being attentive to fighting it is part of the problem. Sometimes it's for me, if I get on my phone, it, it's kind of amazing, right? You can get on there to check a recipe, but next thing I know I'm checking the weather and then I'm checking what color someone else painted their house online. I'm like, how did I even get here? What was I looking for in the first place? It's just such a thin line from one task to the next. So for me, it's sometimes saying, I'm checking a recipe right now. I'll say it out loud. I want to know this is what I'm doing and being intentional because I know. I You're owning know. that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it's being honest about the struggle. And, you know, I think that's just a place where the Holy Spirit loves to help us. I used to think because I actually didn't take a long time off from social media when I was writing this book. 
And I used to think maybe if I just got rid of it completely, but there's a ton of benefits from social that I've, I've experienced too. We can't right. throw those all on at the same time. So I think just that wrestling is, is healthy. I want to be there because we can go either way on each side of it so easily. All of a sudden my consumption can go up. So I want to wrestle with the Lord over this. I want the Holy Spirit to convict me when it's too much, when it's too big of a place in my life, when it's wasting time. I want to number my days and live them well. So it's a question we want to keep on asking with the Lord. Is this, am I using my time wisely? Show me, convict my heart. Because that's the job of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was going up and he was preparing his disciples in John 14, he said, I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit who will teach you all things and remind you of all things that I've said to you. So this is his job. He's going to help us to remember. He's going to help us stay focused. He is for our good here. And we have these minds that are made to do this, right? So it's just asking the Lord, help me. That is the prayer that he runs to answer. Can you help me be focused with my life? I don't want to waste my days away and hours on my phone. I want to use this for your glory. So can you help me here? But it seems like society is built in such a way where distraction is just common. Distraction is what we do. It's the way, it's the, it's the way of the world in a sense. But you said something that really piqued my interest. You said, our bodies are designed for obedience. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, this is kind of funny. I was thinking about this while we were talking about sharing our stories. I was reading just this morning in Philemon where he's, uh, where Paul's writing and he says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So sharing it is not only helping the listener, but it's helping the teller, right? And we tell our story and our testimonies of what God has done it, it re, um, reassuring our memory as well as theirs. And there's really two parts to memory. So they let me get into this nerdy stuff in the book, all the neuroscience of it. But there's really two important parts to memory. There's the encoding when we're receiving the information. And then there's the retrieval, right? Where it comes out. And so often we focus on the encoding side of it. Like if I could just read another book, if I could listen to another podcast, if I could get this deal figured out. And then we have 10 books and we've only read the first three chapters of them because we can't stay so good long enough to fix them, right? Or to finish them. But it's actually the retrieval that is highly important for remembering for the long term. So I want to tell you that story. And I want to tell it again. And I want to tell my kids. And I want to tell my grandkids or wherever I'm at with that. Because that's an important part of remembering as well. Yeah. And when people make fun of their friends because their friends share the same story over and over and over, there's actually a benefit to that. Mm-hmm. It's helpful for <laughs> our own self-esteem. It's helpful for our own growth. It's helpful for the growth of others. I love how you talk about the encoder and the decoder. As an interpersonal communication grad, when mm-hmm. I was in college, I took a class on listening and that was it. It was like people encode messages, people decode messages. Mm-hmm. I would have never thought of the nerdy aspect of listening, but it is about receiving and giving of messages. It is about telling stories. It's about us sharing ours and also others sharing theirs. And in that way, we connect with one another, you know, and so we can be vulnerable with each other. And I love how you said, as we tell our story, it helps us through repetition and the listener as they receive that message. You also mentioned that as we face distraction and really as we face our own denial of our desire to go headlong into distraction, we can ask God to convict us. What does your prayer life look like as you are asking God to help you think through and address distraction in your life? It's first of all, constant asking, right? It's a constant conversation because there's always something new. It, it might be your watch. It might be a new social app. There's always something new. It's always changing a little bit. So we think we might've mastered one area if I just delete this app from my phone but then all of a sudden we see that it's another app. I tell a little story in the book when I went on a sugar fast and all of a sudden, you know, giving up sugar wasn't that big of a deal to me, but all of a sudden I was eating chips and said, I don't care about chips, right? But we're so, we're so quick. So just like, I'll just pivot to the next thing because if I can't have that, then I guess I'll have this. So it's asking the Lord to, to really get behind the surface distractions and will you help me? But then it's also listening. I feel like prayer to be a lot of talking, but it's listening. It's what conviction am I feeling when I'm on my phone and I know I'm wasting time. It's not, it doesn't have to be the phone. It could be the television. It could be a hundred other things. It could be magazines, whatever. Pick your poison. But I want to be a good listener. When I hear my kids asking me a question, sometimes that can be the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be like, you're, you're wasting your time here. Is this what I want to be doing? And so I want to be a listener and I want to be quick to turn and walk away when I know I'm not using my time wisely. I've found that really listening to other people and actually being present in the moment 
helps me to push distraction to the side. But it's so easy to not be there, to be focused on something else. I remember as a college pastor, when my students would come to me, sometimes I would have things that were on my plate and I would be wrestling with them and I'd be on my phone and I'd be doing this. And I'm like, hey, I'm listening. I'm multitasking. I'm here. I'm focused. But I wasn't focused. And they Mm -hmm. knew that. And so that's why I love this idea of really asking God to meet us in it, because in doing that, you're not denying it anymore. You're facing it. You're saying, this is a problem. God, I want to invite you into my problem. And I want to, I want you to help me think through how to be more present in conversations. What does that look like for you as you've battled distraction? What does that look like for you with your friends and your family and in your local community? Well, one helpful tool to use in practicality is really differentiating between interruption and distraction. I think we get more irritated by interruptions. I don't want to be interrupted. I'm doing something right now that's really important, right? But we can easily let our thoughts and our eyes wander to distraction. And we don't seem to get distracted from our distraction, right? Like here we are just wasting time scrolling on a screen, the news feed or whatever else. And I don't get distracted from that and all of a sudden start cleaning the countertop, right? Like we just let our minds go in that direction. But it's the interruptions that frustrate us. But when we look through the whole of scripture, we saw that Jesus was interrupted all the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. He didn't go anywhere. You show up on the shore and there's other people racing him to the other side. Like, I think, God, that'd be so exhausting, right? Right. right. And he dealt with what's in front of him. He had, because he had a sense of the mission more than the moment. Now, I get my eyes so focused on this moment. I want to get this done. I I have have a timeline. I have to be on. It's got to be done. You know, so I get really frustrated in the moment because I lose my sense of mission. But Jesus always had the sense of mission. So if someone showed up on the shore, he's dealing with it. The woman who touched his robe, he's stopping. He's going to take care of this. And then he's going on his way. And he's not interrupted from where he's going. He's just going on his way after that. When he meets the woman at the well, you know, he's tired. He's thirsty. He's sitting down for a drink. And here, and nope, I got work to do. And the disciples are like, what, aren't you starving? And he said, no, I got food that you don't even know about because it's food if you to do the work that the father set him to do. So I just want to live with the same mission. And if my day gets interrupted, a lot of times those are divine interruptions, right? God gave me four kids, okay? There's a lot of divine interruptions going on. But sometimes like worship and serving the Lord, it's serving the people that he put right in front of me. Absolutely. And I think a lot of times we do exactly what you just mentioned. We take interruptions and we're like, no, no, I'm not going to deal with that. That's a distraction. No, it may be a distraction from what you want to do, but as you have just mentioned in scripture, over and over and over, Jesus is interrupted. And there's something beautiful about it because it can shake us out of the fact that we actually are distracted. Yeah. We can be distracted by good things. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned interruption versus distraction. And you also mentioned mission versus the moment. Could you share a little bit more about the difference there? Well, the hard part is that our world is oriented for the moment. And and that's some of the struggle with social because everything is refreshing itself so quickly, right? We get new by the minute. Not, nothing goes unscathed. We had years ago, you would have to wait till the next day's newspaper came out or whatever else to get the news or wait till the Pony Express brought information. And we had to wait for these things. But now everything is oriented toward this present moment. And if you missed it, you missed it. You didn't know who had a birthday party or what else you missed out on, right? So everything is oriented toward this moment. But throughout scripture, we're always like, Jesus was always looking toward his father's timing. He had a big sense of this is my mission. I am on a mission and I don't want to miss that. So this moment isn't going to frustrate me. This moment isn't what I'm missing out on because I always have the greater mission in mind. And that, that's just the hardest concept that I really want to live. I want to see, because I, sometimes I can't differentiate. Is this a distraction? Is this an interruption? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? It's hard in the moment, right? But I don't want to lose the sense of God's heart, his mission for me here. Do you struggle with that too? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's when I'm lacking purpose, when I am kind of just not focused on my mission or my purpose, that is when I'm distracted. That is when I will let the random thoughts take root and I won't be focused on what I know that helps me better love myself and love my neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so really just, I, I love that. When we're grounded in our mission, when we're grounded in our purpose, that can free us from the demands of the moment. We can look at the moment and if there's an interruption that we need to bring in, it's great. It's like the difference between boundaries and walls, right? Walls lock us in, but boundaries, you have that door where you can decide, I'm gonna open this door and I'm gonna let this person in or I'm gonna let this person out. 
And I think that is a way that we can handle the necessity of the moment while also remaining vigilant on our mission. I've really appreciated this conversation and talking through how to avoid distraction and how to stay on the mission that God has called us to. What are three things that you could give our audience as they're wrestling with distraction in their lives? The first one I would give them is to get behind the distraction. Like a lot of times the things that really frustrate us or we think are the problem are really just the symptoms. So get behind the distraction. The second one would be to know that you don't fight alone. So a lot of times we want to put these, we want to get rid of this app or just move these things away from us. But we can ask the Holy Spirit to help us to remember truth. We can ask him. He walks with us here. He's our helper. So we can say, can you, can you prompt my heart? Can you remind me? And so we don't have to fight alone in just getting rid of those distractions. And then it always comes back to a heart level. It's the focus of our heart more than our eyes, not a surface level issue. So I want a heart that follows Christ. I was reading this morning some writing from Tozer and he was saying, focus is, or sorry, worship is just a product of focus. We just want to focus on God. And that's what I want a life that focuses on God. That, you know, we don't think of worship that way, but how are we going to no. worship if we can't focus on him? Absolutely. So I don't want a mind that is so divided and so distracted that I can't focus on anything anymore. And sometimes it feels that way. Like my attention span is just nothing anymore. But Lord, if, I, if I'm to glorify you here, I've got to be able to focus on you. So can you help me have a heart focused on you? And so you would say ultimately that distraction can take root in our hearts when we are not focused on the right things or the right person, that being God. Absolutely. Katie, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, it's been a treasure. Thank you. If you are interested in more conversations like this one, buy my book, Vulnerable Rethinking Human Trafficking. If you want bonus episodes, as well as a plethora of other resources, become a paid member at lmpg.org for $10 a month. You will get access to our bonus podcast, More Mercy, where we dive deeper. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave MercyCast a five-star review. We want to hear from you, so you can email us at info at mercycast.com. Till next time, have mercy on yourselves and each other.